Welcome to episode 320 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? All right, Rob, how are you doing? Doing okay. Uh, we are getting closer to uh, CPP Con. You getting excited? I don't know if I'm excited yet because I'm still <laughs> trying to figure out if I'm excited about Tech Town because there's still no True. news from Norway there. Yeah. Although I do want to comment, and I know you and I were just talking, chatting about this right before we started. Mm -hmm. um, I am the, as far as I know, the only on-site CBPCon class. I'm definitely the only pre-conference on-site CBPCon class that is still moving forward. And I do have students, so it is highly likely that the class will still go forward. If you're thinking about coming to CBPCon and you want to go to a in-person class, come sign up for mine. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. It's the practical performance practices I've mentioned that um, on the show before. This is new class for me. Awesome. Well, I hope it goes well. I hope a couple more people sign up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, at the top of every episode, I like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got this tweet from Pejman, who we had on the show uh, a couple months ago, I believe. Hmm. And he wrote, mm -hmm. shout out to Jason and Rob for encouraging me to submit during our CPP cast chat back in June. Now I need to scramble and figure out how to prepare for this talk. I never thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did great on the on the show. I'm sure his talk will be great. Yeah, that's yeah. Although we, we all are feeling that if you're paying attention on Twitter right now, lots of speakers who are thinking about both Tech Town and, C Tech Town and CBP Con are like, wait a minute, I actually have to get this thing done in the next week, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> okay, well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Brandon Duick. Brandon is a software engineer and roboticist who really enjoys problem solving for complex systems. Brandon is the director of system software at Exxon, where he leads and contributes to a wide variety of projects. He's particularly interested in simultaneous localization and mapping. Recently, he has been working on the calibration methods that ensure the Exxon systems can register LiDAR sensor movements with the highest possible accuracy. Brandon holds a BS and MS in electrical engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. Brandon, welcome to the show. Thank you. What the heck is simultaneous localization and mapping? It's uh, commonly called SLAM. It's a uh, it's a very very popular uh, algorithm domain in uh, robotics. So uh, you can imagine if you're a robot that knows nothing about the world around you, uh -huh. and you turn on and you have to simultaneously figure out both where you are in that environment and also map that environment at the same time. It sounds like uh, virtually every adventure game ever written, pretty much. You've woken up and you don't remember who you are. Now we have to. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to do my dramatic radio voice uh, entry to the show. Right. Yeah. Uh, and also joining us today is Billy Sisson. Uh, mm -hmm. Billy is the director of motion planning at Exxon with prior experience at United Technologies, now Raytheon. He studied computer science and systems in undergrad at Rensselaer Polytechnic with focus on robotics, controls, and electrical engineering. He's been programming professionally using C++ for 12 years. At Exxon, Billy focuses on the autonomy of the robot. How does the robot build a searchable map of the environment? How does the robot efficiently generate safe paths from A to B? And how does the robot explore the environment in a way that maximizes information gain? Billy, welcome to the show. Hey, uh, great to be here. That's, uh, well, I, we're gonna talk about all this stuff in a few <laughs> minutes, I guess, but there's so much to unpack in both y'all's bios. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, like Jason said, we'll, we'll definitely be talking a whole lot more about robots and drones. But first, we just have a couple news articles to discuss. So feel free to comment on any of these guys, OK? Sounds good. OK, so the first one, uh, CPPCon 2021. The main program has been announced. And uh, yeah, you can now see all the talks that will be happening. There's more details about exactly how the uh, hybrid event is going to work. Uh, yeah, so looks like it should be a good conference. I'm, I'm excited. I am also excited because I am speaking at 11 a.m. on Monday morning. <laughs> that means I get to actually go to this conference. Very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Usually John shuffles me to the last day, but uh, I managed to get in before that this time. Nice. Uh, do either of you, have you ever attended uh, CPPCon before? I've never attended uh, in person. I've, I've definitely watched some of the talks after the fact. But, uh... Yeah. 
we were supposed to attend it this year, but you know, things get in the way. I gotta yeah. say, there's a lot of interesting talks going on, like right out of the gate, uh, thinking about programs algebraically, sums products. Mm. And it's interesting that there's both online and in-person keynotes like that's, but they'll both be broadcasted and stuff. So is, is Straustrup's talk considered the, the, the keynote there, or is that just a talk? Um, the main keynote. It is the opening keynote. One of them is, but then he's also giving another one on Monday. He's giving two talks on Monday, which I don't believe I he's ever done at CVPCon. Hmm. And so I know a couple of the people who are um, competing with him at 2 p.m. on Monday morning, and they're not necessarily thrilled about that. Yeah, it's a rough time slot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, next thing we have is a library on GitHub. This is Tuplet, a lightweight tuple library for modern C++. And this is a header-only library, and it looks like it's pretty easy to use. Single include file, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the examples look quite nice. Like, you can just, uh, you know, get your uh, tuple item with um, just by passing, like, tuple and then, uh, you know, within brackets one or two or whatever, Yeah. You know. I got to say that that overload of the, uh, of the index operator, that's some cool stuff right there. <laughs> yeah. It's a neat trick. So the thing that jumped out at me on this is uh, with CPPcast, it kind of always comes back to ABI breaks. That, uh, <laughs> last section there at the bottom. Oh, I missed that. What is it with API breaks on the bottom? So the, he has a section right before the benchmarking section where he's uh, saying, "Okay, well, can the can this can this implementation ever become the standard?" And of course, uh, it'll be an ABI break to try to make that kind of change. Yeah. Oh, okay. This is an interesting. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Brandon. I was just wondering if I didn't get far enough into it to, to figure out if it seems like C++ 20 features are, are kind of what are required to make this, make this implementation work. Uh, I know it's possible to do a similar implementation in C++ 17, um, but I don't know how much of this requires C++ 20. I had, I had a little bit of a moment as I was reading this because I'm like, well, the only way that they did this is if it was like, because I did a toy tuple implementation myself. Um, it's Okay, so, all right, I'll back up. The, the lot of what the author here complains about, uh, that tuple is not trivially copyable and stuff like that, comes down partially to the fact that tuple is typically implemented as um, recursive uh, inheritance. So you've got uh, you know, like this ridiculous inheritance hierarchy that's built when you uh, create a tuple with one of the standard implementations. And I'm reading this thinking, well, the only way that the author could have done this is if they didn't use recursion. And that was something that I did as an exercise on my own, like three or four years ago, just to see if it was possible to make tuple without recursive templates. And so, yeah, that same technique is definitely possible in C++ 17 and can get you at least most of the way there anyhow. But it really made me sad. I didn't thought about the fact that tuple is not trivially copyable when it contains a tri only trivial types. I did see that there was an ACCU talk on how C++20 can simplify the tuple implementation, but I, I didn't get that far. All right. I didn't get down there either. Yeah. OK. And then this last blog post we have is stood span should have a converting constructor from initializer list. There's a post on uh, Arthur O'Dwyer's blog. Jason, you want to tell us about this one? Yeah, we haven't talked. I mean, Arthur was publishing an article like twice a right. day for a while there, right? Yeah. We haven't put one of his up here on a while. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just the fact that if you have a function that takes a standard span, you can't pass an initializer list to it. It's pretty much just that simple. Um, and so he's making the argument for a converting constructor that would allow you to do that easily. Certainly seems like that would uh, be a good addition. Makes sense. The other thing that kind of jumped out at me, though, is this. He says, uh, when string view was adopted as the parameter only replacement for const string, we suffered through a few years of people worrying about the proverbial, proverbial newbie writing dangly reference bugs like this, and gives an example. 
And it's interesting that in Arthur's mind, this is just, oh, that's a solved problem. We just train programmers to not use string views as local objects. Um, but I would say there's a considerable number of people that don't have that mindset. And uh, I've just had discussions about this on Twitter a couple weeks ago. I don't mean to out myself as one of those people with those <laughs> mindsets, but in our domain, we do things like returning blocks of matrices all the time. Mm -hmm. like enforcing this parameter only like design constraint is a little, I, I don't know how I feel about it. I feel like there should be something that's supported about it in terms of like lifetime extensions or whatnot. I, I mean, I totally agree with you. I was someone that was saying, wait, what do you mean you're not allowed to have a local string view object? Because if you were past a string view object and then you want to do like parsing over that, and shrink it and grow it and do whatever, take some subsection of that and return it back out, you're going to have local string view variables, no question. So I, I agree with you, just for the record. <laughs> it's one reason I found it interesting that Arthur thought this was a completely solved problem. <laughs> OK, well, uh, Brandon and Billy, we've had some episodes a long time ago, I think, about robotics. Um, it's definitely been quite a while. I don't think we've ever specifically talked about like UAS and drones. So could one of you just start off by telling us a little bit about you know, what you work on at XNAI? Sure. So uh, at the highest level, a lot of the problems are going to be pretty common across, across all robotic systems. So the, the SLAM, simultaneous localization mapping that we already referred to, uh, motion planning and control, motion control. Um, but from there, uh, there's a kind of a couple interesting things about our company and, and the aerial system that that uh, presents some really interesting challenges. So uh, the first of these is that we decided early on to, to provide a fully infrastructure-free solution. So this means that we don't rely on GPS to help us solve that SLAM problem. It means that we don't rely on communications back to a base station to, uh, so for example, other systems might rely on getting kind of continual operator inputs to help control where the system is going, or they might uh, offload some computing from a, a small aerial vehicle, try to offload that to the base station so that it can solve really math and really uh, computation intensive problems, right? So because we decided to be fully infrastructure free, we have to be able to do all of these things on the system, which has to be lightweight, which means it has a, a small compute. Uh, so if you if you kind of take those two constraints, um, now you can start to get into to some of the, uh, the unique and interesting problems that we, that we face. So uh, pr probably one of the best ones, uh, I'll go back to the, the operator input here. Um, if we're if we're sending our system around the corner where you can't you can't see what it's seeing at the time you but you needed to kind of come back to you with a uh, or also I, sh I should back up a little bit our, our our main our main use case is to provide to provide maps of environments that operators can't can't reach can't access so uh, here I'm now getting back to the problem so uh, Billy has done a lot of really interesting work here in terms of exploration so you send this robot into a new environment that has no prior map of whatsoever. How can it efficiently and, and optimally explore that environment, deciding where to go, when, and come back to you with a, with a full coverage map of that space? Right. So you, you sent us some videos right before uh, the show, and I did watch some of those like videos of this drone flying around in, in a cave system or mine shaft or something like that, exploring it and being able to provide mapping as it goes. Um, what are some of like the real world use cases where you're using drones to do that sort of thing? So, so that is the uh, that that mining use case is our is our main revenue driver at this point. So we have a lot of a lot a lot of mining customers that are using our system right now in the field underground. Uh, the kind of the, the first use case that comes up is these mines will blast areas of the mines. Uh, at which point, these are no longer uh, areas that can be safely accessed by by humans. So but they still need to know, okay, well, what does this environment look like after I've blasted? So uh, the, the purpose of our system is they can kind of set up from a safe distance away, put the robot down. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but effectively point it at this area that they, they need to survey, uh, hit the go button on our system. It'll fly usually, in this use case, it's a pretty short flight, maybe three to five minutes, provide it and uh, fly and ex explore a map that space and come back with a very high resolution, very accurate point cloud uh, map. So that'll give you that'll give you the ability to visualize and fully perceive what the what the environment looks like. Just out of curiosity, is that where the LIDAR comes in at that point? I saw you mentioned that in your bio. 
Yes. So the uh, the lidar is our our primary sensing pipeline. Obviously, we also use an inertial measurement unit as well to to complement the uh, localization uh, pipeline. Interesting. But the, the okay. lidar the lidar generates the map for us. So, uh, um, use gyroscopes or something for your inertial measurement. Is that what you're talking about? Yep. yep. So accelerometers and gyroscopes are the uh, are the uh, sensors there. Okay, now I'm going to completely go off on a tangent here, but um, are you using like the tiny like solid state kinds of things or more like higher end, yes, solid state things? Tiny that solid state, yeah. And mm -hmm. those provide enough accuracy to give you some awareness of your movement? So, uh, so all it's got to do is it's only got to give you enough accuracy for a little bit of time, right? Okay. Because the LiDAR is, is, is it's, uh, it's scanning in our case at like three-ish hertz or something. So three hertz, the robot knows very, fairly well like how much it's moved since the last time it's scanned. Okay. So all the IMU has to do is predict the movement for that uh, that short like 300 milliseconds of time. And turns out it's pretty good at doing that, okay. um, especially with the caliber of IMUs we tend to use. So to, I, I, to, to add a little bit there, so the, the reason why it needs to, the reason why you do need, you can't just take that those three hertz lidar measurements is because that's not going to give you fine enough or high resolution enough state information to feed into our control pipeline. And uh, another reason okay. is because for the lidar to actually work, you need to use the higher rate information from the IMU to uh, undistort the. So uh, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of depth that you have to, have to try to figure out how to navigate here. But a lidar measurement is it's not just like you get a snapshot of the entire world every 300 milliseconds. It's it's doing a continuous scan. Oh, I guess okay. Yeah. So if the if the vehicle well the vehicle is almost always moving over the course of that time, so you need to use that inertial information to undistort those measurements mm -hmm. so that you can then feed it into the to accurately register your scans to your map. Okay. So if you could actually like in in a theoretical world, if you could snapshot at each location, then you could just line up the point clouds and be can and carry on with your life. Exactly. But you can't. Unfortunately, well, I guess maybe, maybe it is fortunate because that gives us a job. Right. <laughs> now, I've actually bought one of the tiny I squared C uh, nine axis sensors with you know solid state gyroscope, whatever accelerometer in it. And I've yet to actually play with it, so this is where my curiosity comes from. There. Sure. I th it might be worth describing for our listeners what lidar is and how exactly this helps you in the situation as well. I guess I'll take this one. So it's, it's uh, I always forget the, it's laser, help me, Billy, laser. It's, uh, man, I, don't, I actually don't know what it stands for. It's like, it's like, laser image. It's laser range sensor. That's, that's what it is. Uh, oh, man, this is embarrassing. Light it's like detection in ranging is, is what I see on Google. Light detection. I had that part. I, I forgot the middle. Uh, okay. So uh, this is, uh, so there's, there's, there's lots of different LIDAR packages, but essentially all these things are doing is using a, a laser to get a, a very pretty accurate. So we're talking for the sensor we're using, it's about a three centimeter standard deviation on a laser measurement ranging anywhere from one meter to a hundred meters out. Okay. Um, and the particular LIDAR we use is, is very popular in the autonomous vehicle space. So it's used in a lot of autonomous cars. Uh, and this is a, it's basically got the simplest way to describe it is it has 16 laser beams on a on an axis that are spinning around. So it's taking a 360 degree field of view with 16 beams vertically ranging from minus 15 degrees to plus 15 degrees. It's giving you over the course of a pretty short time window, it's giving you those, what ends up being 16 times 900. So about 14,000 measurements over that cylinder. So okay. you can imagine with, with uh, that, that gives you pretty dense point, point information to work with to feed into that slam pipeline that we've talked about before. Okay. So, you know, you, you talked a little bit about what makes your platform different from some of the other platforms, how you're doing absolutely everything on the drone. So do you want to tell us a little bit about those constraints in more detail? Like how much computer can you fit on these drones? So this is a, this is a point we're trying to improve actually. So the, the, the compute platform we have on there right now is a, it's basically an Intel nuke. If you're familiar with that, mm -hmm. it's, approximately equivalent to a laptop, just a little bit more beefier than that. Um, so 
I mean, one of the critical like constraints of, of this is it's a CPU only platform. So we're, we're pretty much running all of our algorithms, all of our processing, um, all of our drivers on a CPU. Um, and, oh man, how much does the Nuke itself weigh? It's like 250 grams or something like that out of a total max payload capacity for the payload, for the uh, platforms we fly with, like 1.2 kilograms. So already compute is using up a lot of the payload. It uses up a lot of the battery. Like the compute itself doesn't use up the battery. It's the weight of the compute that uses the battery, right. which, is, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. So the um, the compute constraints, it, it means that we're, we're basically limited to what? Four cores plus hyper-threading um, uh, processing power, 32 gigs of RAM, which is actually quite a bit when you think about it. Um, we actually don't currently run up against the um, uh, the compute constraints uh, as much until you want to start investigating algorithms that run better on GPUs, which is that's something that we really want to extend to. Um, I know there's a lot of popular platforms like that or for that for like the um, what's it called? It's Nvidia's thing. Um, Jetson TX2. Yeah, that's the one. The, the TX2 and the Xavier. Those, those platforms. Those are little tiny embedded GPU core things, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, relatively speaking. They're, relatively speaking, yeah. They're actually about the same size as the Nuke. Um, oh, OK. Um, at least the Xavier is. The, the TX2 is actually quite a bit smaller. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 those, it's those compute and, um, and those are the compute constraints you run up against. I mean, another, another major constraint, too, is battery life. Um, the, the drone has to carry its own power source, um, which limits it to like 20, 25 minutes of flight time. So you got to get all that stuff done in 25 minutes from takeoff to landing. Just make a hybrid model with a gas powered charger <laughs> on board. Consider it. Has anyone ever actually done that with like a small gas powered, uh, RC motor or something like that? Is that actually a thing or, you know, that, that sounds crazy. Well, even more with this, I remember from a few years ago, there were some videos of some people playing around with jet engines. And so, so you can, a uh, quad rotor, right? That's our system. Right. But I think some people put jet engines instead of each of the, the four props. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, an interesting approach, let's say. Probably doesn't have quite as fast of uh, feedback as you expect from a brushless yeah. motor. Slow, slow response time, for sure. Right. No, definitely. But, uh, In terms... Sorry. So going back to what you were asking, Rob, about um, the the compute constraints. So so actually, so this is the area that Billy kind of specializes in. Probably what the part of our stack that's been optimized the most to run efficiently is the, uh, the motion planning uh, part of our software stack. So I'll just give a little bit of a high level context, and Billy can kind of jump into some of what he's done. But you can imagine for an aerial system, we're exploring in three dimensional space as opposed to many ground robots that might just be planning over a, a two dimensional surface. So that means that we actually have to um, keep track of a much larger searchable uh, map space. And then you can you can also imagine that searching for optimal paths or optimal routes through that three-dimensional space can be very uh, computationally uh, costly. So so I mean, again, I'll, I'll pass over to Billy here. So he's he's the kind of the subject matter expert for our, our, our cell-based uh, grid or cell-based map representation, and then also for the the search algorithms that we run over that map. Yeah, so mapping, planning, this kind of this kind of stuff. It's um, it's a strange fusion between like trying to optimize the code as much as possible and also trying to make it like do as little work as possible. Um, so we tend to take this hierarchical approach to the problem, where you sort of think about it like as you're driving from from city to city. You think about the highways that you're driving along, right? You don't think about like tree A and tree B and car A that you have to avoid along the way. Like there's this there's this notion like in our planning stack of global planning, course global planning. And it does so over a very, a very simplified representation of the world. So this is what I mean about like reduce the work that you do. Um, and then you also, in addition, have to solve the problem of okay, I, I have to avoid things densely, right? I have to, I have to dodge tree A at some point. <laughs> right. So, 
Um, so this is this is where like the second. Sorry. I said it's more like skiing than driving. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, when you when you factor dynamics to to an extent, um, so this local this local level of planning actually goes beyond like the three D realm uh, too, because it's also planning in terms of velocities and the momentum of the vehicle. Like it knows that it can't stop on a dime, for example. Right. So when it's trying to plan, when it's trying to maintain the flight speeds that we that we advertise we maintain, um, <laughs> it has to it has to know that it. It can't turn sharply. It has to slow down, or it has to go into a banked turn uh, to actually enter corridors at speeds um, and stuff like that. So that's a lot of, hmm. I'll be honest, that's a lot of like magic, magic secret sauce. Um, once you get sure. too far below that, but um, it's really, I, I gotta be honest. In terms of optimizing this thing, it's all about making the algorithm do less work rather than making the code run faster. If there's a distinction that can be made there. So I appreciate you don't want to go too much into secret sauce, but uh, do you have like a, a pre-computed physics model on board or are you taking everything dynamically in case there's like a draft in the mine shaft or something like that? Um, this kind of, I can talk about that. This kind of goes down like to the bit, to the, the fundamentals of control. We do, there's, there's, there's elements of what we call feed forward where the robot knows what trajectory it's going to be taking, roughly how fast it has to, or, Speed's not part of it. How much it has to be accelerating at a certain point in time to, to actually hit this trajectory. And then there's this element of feedback, disturbance rejection. When a, when a gust of wind blows, it only has to correct for that little bit off of the trajectory that it already knows that it's following, right? Okay. Um, so that's how, you, when you sum those two things together, that's how it, uh, that's how it reacts to the real world events. So, uh, okay, then another thing that I was just thinking about, like I'm, I'm trying to imagine like how constrained and or dangerous are the environments, dangerous to the life of the drone that you're flying through. And like, do you ever have to take into account and say like, well, in, in this corner, you know, I'm gonna be getting like swash from the rotors or something else that'll make it too difficult for me to make this passage. So there's there's a couple of heuristic ways that we approach this. Um, so first of all, you got to start with a with reasonable assumptions, right? Like if somebody hops into the environment and chucks a baseball at you, there's no way that you're right, 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 sure. Right. Um, so we we do make we do make certain assumptions on like how static the environment is. I believe we call it the pseudo static assumption. Um, okay. If a change happens, we see it happen, and it doesn't. It's not that quick. Um, so we also have a piece of the, of the stack at the high level. This is actually like part of the exploration. It knows, the robot knows when it's exploring, when it's flying to places to not like fly into a blind spot, right? Okay. It actually would be mm -hmm. really dangerous for it to do so. Um, so it doesn't know what's in that blind spot. If it's going three meters a second into what could potentially be a wall, that's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, so, so it keeps track of like, the areas that it's seen. It knows the areas, it knows the boundary between the seen and the unseen. It's always constructing a plan to see that boundary hmm. rather okay. than fly into the unknown directly. How many uh, How many of these drones did you lose during the development of the <laughs> of algorithms? <laughs> um, so this is actually an interesting point. Um, uh, more than I'm comfortable stating, however, <laughs> less than if we had a simulator right so okay. a ton of a ton of algorithm development happens in simulation before it even reaches a piece of hardware so okay. we've already sussed out a majority of the things that can cause a crash by the time we leave the simulation framework so you have a, a full simulation framework that you could what time step replay figure out what went wrong all that stuff mm -hmm. Cool. And then, and now that you mentioned that logging is just like super important for these things. Um, it's actually one of the, one of the most critical frameworks on the, on the device. It's not just like logging terminal output, but logging sensor information, hmm. communications between modules in the, in the software stack, like all of that stuff is logged into this giant, this giant bag of data on the, on the device that you can play back, um, 
uh, the developers can play back and see what went wrong or what went right. Usually it's a lot of what went right. We, we also will often use the, uh, the sensor inputs from previous log data to, if we're making a change to a, a critical algorithm, we can actually re, we can test that change on the log data from previous flights. Mm. Which In the simulation. Yep, yep. So, so mm. almost everything will be tested in simulation first, uh, but there, I mean, there's still points where it's, it's just, it's, you get more information or at least additional information from testing those algorithms on real world data. So right. uh, this is maybe maybe an area we'll get into actually more in this um, later in the discussion here, but um, we do have our entire code base. So you might think that we don't have to worry too much about backwards compatibility. Uh, however, we have, since we have a trove of, lo of log data, we have to actually keep mm. backwards compatibility in mind just because we wanna make sure that we can continue to test our algorithms on our log data. How like uh, proven and tested is your physics simulation, your simulated environment, or more, maybe more directly what I'm trying to ask is, do you use your real world log data to ever refine your physics model for your simulation? Um, in terms of the quadrator dynamics that we simulate, they're actually yeah. fairly, fairly basic, fairly textbook. Um, okay. Cause you don't, you don't really need to go too much further beyond that to simulate the behavior of the autonomous behavior that accurately. Um, I'll comment there are some efforts to, to go deeper into that, but, um, Justin probably doesn't want me talking about that. Um, so uh, the other thing that you can refine, like rather than the dynamics of the system, is like the maps that it's simulating um, okay. within. Um, and we have done this in the past where we take a scan of a mine that it's flown in or a, or a we'll stick with a mine that it's flown in. Um, and fit surfaces to it and just stick that into the implementation, into the simulation. Okay. Um, and so one of the things Brandon brought up a couple minutes ago was, re was rerunning software modules on logs data. Um, this is fantastic for like open loop, um, as we call it, pieces of the system, um, where it's just like data in, data out, that kind of thing. But you do have to modify the simulation if you want to test closed loop pieces of the system, like the planning stack. Okay. Can we talk a little bit more about, you know, the C++ software itself? Like, are you uh, using any popular open source libraries for your software stack? Oh, for sure. We, we, uh, we, we love open source for, um, uh, so the autonomy stack on its own, I mean, there's, Boost is like a critical piece of it. Um, uh, everything from like the graph to the coroutine library. I think I'm missing some things. Um, another cup, another pop, a couple of popular like mathematical libraries like Eigen series, OpenCV. Um, and there's communication stuff like Protobuf and Zero MQ uh, that we make use of. Wow. What about the, the flight control software itself? Like I've got a friend who does hobbyist drone things and he's always hacking on his drone with one of these open flight, open source flight control systems. So to so, this point, we've uh, designed it such that the output of our system was a thrust roll pitch yaw command. So we own everything above thrust roll pitch yaw. Okay. Uh, so that's, you can imagine you have some trajectory that you're trying to plan over everything between there and outputting the thrust roll pitch yaw is, is our software. Uh, okay. But then we do, we do rely on uh, lower level flight controllers. So uh, what you'd be referring to there is PX4 or RG Pilot are the two most popular uh, open source flight controllers. I mean, they do provide some of that higher level functionality that, that we've taken over ourselves, but we do rely on those implementations for the, the low level flight control. So that's converting our TRPY thrust roll pitch yaw into individual motor commands. So you're just hooking up to the uh, radio pins, the, the the RX pins on the flight control module or whatever and saying, this is the inputs I want to feed into you. Yes. Yeah, you could, you could visualize it like that. Like the autopilot that we write is controlling the vehicle like a person would right. um, in terms of your commanding its tilt, your commanding its collective thrust. Um, we, do we do actually command it at a much more, a much lower level like API um, or using like RG pilots or PX4's API. Um, oh, okay. So it is actually a serial link. We are actually sending messages to the thing, but I see. Um, 
So not like literally taking over the electrical connections that would be coming in from a radio module or something. You're, there's a serial interface. I don't, I don't actually know how any of this works. I just know <laughs> that I know people who play with that. So, it's, uh, so, so I guess you, you're, it's like an add-on that can be put onto like many different types of drones. You're not making the drones yourself. Yeah, actually, one of the things we saw or we saw it as is like platform agnostic, right? Okay. So. I mentioned PX4 and RG Pilot, but we also support some closed some closed source RG man some closed source autopilots like DJI. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, they all they all tend to accept the same commands. Like most most under actuated um, vehicles, like a quadroid or even like helicopters or coaxial copters, they're controlled using the same inputs. It's like thrust and and uh, rotation. Right. Any fixed wing aircraft or other vehicles that you support? That's in the that's in the realm of, of, of much harder. Um, one of the one of the neat things of uh, about like quad rotors is that they can stop. Um, right. Fixed wings <laughs> think this thing where they fall out of the sky if you stop them. In the air. Right. They can glide. So, so we uh, right. I mean, right now our our again going back to revenue drivers. The the aerial system for mining is the, is our is our primary product. Uh, we are starting to branch into just a, a mapping only system. So this is now instead of being controlled by our software, it's just something that an operator will carry around or maybe mount on a vehicle and just, just basically take only that uh, slam part of our system to use that to map out an environment where, where it is at least accessible by the person. Um, okay. And then we are, this is still pretty early stages, but we're also looking at, at, uh, moving our autonomy onto ground vehicles, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, longer term, we we see ourselves as an autonomy software company. So we want to be able to provide either our software or our software in a, a payload that can make any vehicle fully autonomous. Cool. Very cool. Uh, I, uh, go ahead, Jason. Oh, I, I was just going to say, sorry. I mean, I, I just and I, I do enjoy flying things, although it's been a little while since I've actually flown anything all my toys are over here uh so i just keep thinking about these things but it was like maybe i don't know 12 or 14 years ago i was in the cave of the winds national park i think it's cave of the winds or wind, wind cave national park up in south dakota where they're saying uh the park rangers were saying they think that it's the largest cave system in the world but they haven't been able to map the whole thing and i'm like 14 years ago we're only a couple of years away from someone just being able to fly a drone down this thing and map the whole cave system out. And uh, so I'm curious, like what have, has your tool or has anyone approached you about using it for scientific applications also? And you said that mine things is your, is your main driver right now, but like scientific research or archeological mapping or anything like that. So I have to admit here that so when Billy and I, Billy was the third tech, uh, third employee basically, and I was the tenth. Uh, okay. So so back at that time we were a lot more uh, customer facing or, or outward facing in terms of all the different vendors we were taking on. But we've we've grown to sixty people over the last a little over sixty people over the last four years, and uh, wow. have a little less exposure now than I than I did before. Uh, but I know recently we were. I, I don't I don't think it was a mine, but there was some sort of like there was some sort of uh, like collapse or safety issue uh, recently somewhere uh, here in the U.S. And we our systems were called in to 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 explore it so they could basically evaluate the structural integrity of the uh, of whatever damage was done. I don't I don't have the details again because it was just something I was kind of peripherally seeing. Um, as far as like direct science applications. I, I'd almost bet that we've we've had some questions come in, but I, I can't uh, speak to any specific. I'm not sure if you if you remember anything, Billy. No, sadly, sadly, nothing in addition. All right, that's cool. Okay. Uh, are you able to keep up with the latest C++? Are you using C++ 17 or 20? Oh man, so C++ 17 all the way. Um, I was so happy when we switched to it. Freaking structured bindings. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> you have you have no idea how many maps I iterate over. It just made my life so much better. Um, right. But we uh we uh we definitely have eyes for C plus plus twenty. Um I gotta I gotta be honest, there's a lot of like 
package management stuff that makes this upgrade quite difficult. Um, mm. but so I'm you guys have talked about it before. We, we recently switched to, to Conan as our, as okay. our package management solution. Uh, I'm definitely not a, uh, one of the more skilled people we have in that, but, uh, it's starting to help us solve the problem. Uh, we're, we're kind of hoping that over time, it's going to reduce the pain of, of making changes like this. Going back to the um, compute platform, are you running on an operating system or is it, you know, right on the hardware? What, how are you running exactly? Um, it, it's it's running on like an, a Ubuntu server edition okay. um, as the base operating system. It's it's good enough. <laughs> a stable Linux, good enough. Yeah, I mean, I mean long term I, LTS. Right. Does LTS cause any problems for you for staying up to date with your compilers? Um, I gotta honestly, we we actually want to decouple ourselves um, from this. This is this is like part of like the package management sort of endeavor that we're going down. Um, it's just given the pace at which C plus plus evolves, it seems to be disadvantageous to bind yourself to whatever compiler the operating system happened to use. Right. Hmm. Even with the structured bindings we were just talking about, it's driving me nuts that our version of GCC is uh, throws a warning if you don't. You, so if you're iterating over a map and you break it out, we're getting a warning for not using the key. Yeah. Which uh, that extra line of code I have to add drives me nuts. Yeah, they fixed that. When did they fix that? I, sure. I, I do remember hearing that it's if we as soon as we're able to upgrade our GCC version that it's resolved. But I know that our version is still complaining. Yeah, so for the sake of our listeners, if you do a structured binding and an older GCC don't use all of the destructured elements, then you get an unused variable warning. Uh, and a newer GCC, as long as you use at least one of the destructured elements, you don't get that warning anymore. Yep. Yeah, that's oh, also an interesting, interesting think... tidbit. Don't mix structured bindings with lambda captures. It's not good. Yeah, at least in our version of GCC. Yeah, GCC. I mean, C plus plus twenty fixed some of those issues as well too. There was a language standard change involving structured bindings and lambda captures also. That's actually fixed in the next version. Oh man, I think <laughs> working right. to upgrade. <laughs> I, I guess need you to just lit, just lit a fire under our uh, effort to uh, to make sure that we can switch to the next standard. Now I feel compelled to double check that because uh, that's totally relevant. Um, so I was curious about your, uh, you're talking about how important data logging is. And I don't know like what the risk of vehicle destruction is. Like, are you, is it so important that you have to do like flush on every right to the log kind of thing, just in case like the device blows up and you hope to recover the data off of it or what? So this is a this is a good subject to bring up. So I'll, I'll say I'll say off the bat that we this is an area we need to improve on. Uh, but we we um, we have we have gone as far as even just messing with the the operating system settings to even ensure that the uh, the OS is flushing from um, flushing from RAM into into our SSD as as frequently as possible. Because earlier versions where we weren't doing that, we would we could see up to th I think the default setting actually on our Ubuntu server edition is like 30 seconds. So you can imagine if you're troubleshooting incidents and you've lost the last 30 seconds of that log, that it's it's pretty yeah. difficult to find out what's happening. <laughs> right. um, as far as our the actual log recorder, uh, uh, Billy, can you comment if we're taking any? Let's uh, at this, at this. In other words, at the software level, aside from the the OS level, if we're doing anything. Like in terms of using, oh man, what's that flag? O direct or something like that. Um, I don't think we we actually. Um, I don't think we go to that level. I think there was like there's a realization we came to with like Linux and solid state drives and the interaction there. There's just like this. There's this bit of caching you just can't do away with for whatever reason. Um, I think it's like on the SSD itself. I was never able to narrow it down. Um, before oh, yeah, I had you, to move on to something else, this, but this is kind of exposing. Uh, so the your question before Rob about uh, so moving from operating, running on a, an OS to running on kind of bare metal. This is this is this is definitely an area as we 
I mean, we, we are still a startup. Yeah, 60 people is a lot more than we started with, but uh, still not too big of a company. So, I mean, we, as we kind of hire, hire more people and mature our, our product, this would be definitely something we'd be looking at. Right. It makes me think about include OS, which I mean, unfortunately I think has been canceled project now. Remember that one, Rob? Yeah, I do. I didn't realize that was canceled though. That's too bad. The look on Billy's face is that he does not know what include OS is. <laughs> is that accurate? I, I maybe read it on Reddit a while ago, but a lot of it's a C plus plus operating system kernel that you can like literally like pound include the operating system, and then when you're done compiling, you have a standalone bootable binary that has your C plus plus unikernel thing in it. That was a very interesting project, but yeah, I think they stopped development on it a couple of years ago now. I could be wrong. Oh, okay. I kind of feel like the, the containerization craze maybe made it a little bit obsolete. Maybe. Okay, uh, Lambda capture and storage class specifiers of structured bindings, I believe is the feature from C20 that you want, which is supported in GCC 10. There you go. That's nice. My life just got so much better. I'm I wondering um, between all the logging you're doing and just generating these point clouds, uh, how much disk space does that wind up taking over your 20, 25 minutes of flight time? Oh, that's interesting. Oof. Uh, a full 25 minute log takes about 20. It's, it's like a gigabyte per minute, I believe. Okay. Something wow. around there. It's a, it's a little unfair though because we're I, I mean right now this isn't a limiting factor for us right our our, sure. our customers are okay with with kind of logging a lot of information for us I and mean, we're we're intentionally logging as much as possible again given kind of the where we are in our product life cycle um there are there are definitely things that we can choose to turn off from a logging perspective or you can log just the the most compressed versions of, of different parts of our data streams to, to reduce that size. But, um, and there actually is an open software ticket just related to some of the uh, customer experience things to, to reduce that file size. So it's quicker to transfer it, information off the robot and get the get our map right from the robot into their uh, mind management software as fast as possible. So there, there, there is a, a ticket I've been being bugged about to, uh, to, to, to act on. Uh, but but yeah, I mean Billy's right. As of now, we we really are logging on a lot of data. Just use like H two sixty four or something to compress it, right? That should be fine. Then... <laughs> For our video streams, maybe. Actually, we do compress our video streams like that. Um, I will comment though that the gigabyte per minute thing is to generate a log file that's useful for developers. Okay. Right? Um, mm -hmm. The customer facing one, uh, this the raw sensor stream. It's 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 like less than. It's a lot lower than that. I'm not going to quote a number right now. Sure. But that's, you're talking like the LIDAR mapping data that the customer's right. going to care about. Right. Interesting. So, I mean, as an example, I mean, this may be a little too uh, details, but the the raw data for the point clouds is, is, is very, is pretty, is pretty well compressed, but then we actually store our software level representation of the point cloud because it just makes it much easier to if someone wants to kind of play back and visual, even the customer, let's say, would uh, play back the log and, and visualize the cloud from that flight so they can kind of remember which flight it was or or maybe they were just looking for some real-time information on what they what the robot just observed. So we include that, uh, that uncompressed, well, not as compressed version of the, of the point cloud in the log data. Uh, no, but, I mean, visualize the point cloud as it's being created, you're saying? Uh, at, or in other words, right after the, so you might, you might fly, you might do a flight, mm -hmm. the robot, you, you actually can see VR. So I, I did mention that we, uh, okay, two, two things. So I did mention before that we don't rely on the base station, uh, mm -hmm. but we do actually have, there is a tablet that the operator uses to control the system. They, and they, if, as long as there is wireless connectivity, they're able to observe what the robot's seeing in real time. Okay. So they can't, they can see the point cloud that way. Uh, but then what I was also getting at is, okay, so let's say the robot did with five, 10 minute flight comes back. Uh, you can via our log interface on the tablet. You can actually just go back and, and play back that log and see, uh, see real time. What, what the robot observed. Neat. And, and you said you capture video also. So yeah, so we, uh, the, we have versions of our product that, that have a first person video camera on it. Um, the, for our underground systems, we have to have 
a lot of active active lighting to actually so you can actually get, get anything out of that. Right. Uh, but yeah. So in addition to like the LiDAR point cloud kind of thing, you said some versions have a camera. Do you try to capture other color data or an environmental data that might be useful to the client? So this is something that's that's discussed a lot. Uh, I'll, I'll admit that right now the the point cloud map is 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 the main thing. Um, okay. and, again, the first person video as well. Uh, the that lidar map also gives you intensity information, which is useful in some contexts. So that'll that tells you how how what was the relative intensity of the reflection and you can often see uh, things about the environment using that intensity information is that how like light aerial lidar that sees through trees does it rely on that kind of intensity information this is a little different this is more about the um the reflective properties of the actual surface that's being illuminated uh, okay I, I guess there is a little bit of applicability there um okay particularly so you, like through... determine materials that type of thing uh, uh, yeah, so they're okay. so like uh, I mean colors, right? Like a, sure. like a white yeah. wall versus a black wall. There's okay. there's some information uh, to be gained there. Um, okay. But uh, more interesting than that, we, we do have a lot of customers that have asked about other types of sensors. So um, we haven't made too many inroads in this yet, but uh, we spoke with some companies that that manage nuclear facilities, and um, I forget what a, dos a dos dosimeter, right? That's, I think that's the name of the sensor that uh, detects levels of radioactivity. Oh, okay. So having, a, in addition to generating a structural or point cloud type map, you would also envision having localized uh, uh -huh. readings of radioactivity in, in, the, uh, in the site being managed. Radiation uh, map. Yeah, exactly. And um, uh, ga gas sensors for underground mines has been mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so this is something we're we're looking at and trying to kind of expand our offering. But I mean, even right now, there's there's still so many improvements to be made just in terms of the base mapping product and so much interest from the customers that that's been our primary area of focus. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask one other question about your data logging and uh, is is it ever become a problem like a bottleneck in the system where you're like we have to figure out we have to spin off a thread to write these data logs or whatever because because it's it's causing a bottleneck here. So the way that's actually interjected, not interjected, like um, the way that it works in the system is, um, I briefly touched on this before, but so if the system is organized like a modular architecture with like messages flying in between each module. Okay. So the logger itself is just another module that subscribes to everything in its own mm -hmm. process and is only responsible for just like dumping that to disk. Oh, okay. So um, you've already offloaded that to another process, I see. As much as we can. It, it doesn't use all that much CPU, to be honest. OK. OK. So that's actually, um, in, in, at least in terms of kind of software design, software architecture, that's, that's an area that we haven't really got into. But we do have our own. And I'll admit that we've debated the, the merits of this decision a little bit internally. But we have our own um, for, uh, internal uh, software framework for it provides an execution framework, configuration management system, uh, message passing. Uh, so that that's, um, that's something that we've put, uh, we've put a lot of development effort into it. And it is, it is a pretty decent abstraction. So obviously, we're using this framework for our robotics purposes, but uh, it does provide a pretty general use modular execution framework. So you can configure um, a series of software modules that so you could me. So you could run like a couple a couple software modules that might be passing messages on one process, and then have another process that's just running a single module, and you can kind of uh, again via pretty general abstraction uh, and uh, configure configure any set of modules to run that on and like in like a, a plugin style architecture. Okay. And uh, you were asking before about uh, software libraries. So our, our our message passing our message passing system is built on. Uh, uh, zero MQ, okay, and we're using uh, Google Protobuf for our message definitions. Mm -hmm. uh, so that so we I mean we are leveraging open source libraries that we're building on, but it is our own message passing framework that supports publish subscribe, uh, request reply. Uh, we also have broadcast replies built into that request reply framework. So so we are we are solving some even though we are a robotics company, 
we definitely have some more traditional software problems that we have to solve because of the fact that we're maintaining this, this uh, execution framework. Right. And I'd like to add that in addition to like the two libraries you mentioned, ASIO from Boost, it's, it, you, you can imagine with messages flying around, request replies flying around that like asynchronous programming paradigms are super important to us. Mm. Um, so we make, a, we make heavy use of ASIO and coroutines and stuff like that. Have you done any research into what those coroutines would look like if you could move to C++20's coroutines? Just the other day he was, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, on Monday. Um, that, yeah, that was a weekend project for me. I, I got to say, C++20 coroutines, they're great, although a bit cryptic to get into. <laughs> yeah, so they, they were sh the library feature, excuse me, the language feature was shipped without a library component right. to help. Mm -hmm. So I did see that there was a talk from the, from CPBCon fr uh, from problem to coroutine reducing IO latency. That that one, I, I haven't got as far into C plus plus twenty coroutines as Billy has. I I felt guilty after he brought it up and started doing a little bit of reading, <laughs> um, but but the, the at least the abstract from that talk sounded pretty compelling. It does it sounds exactly applicable to what you're doing. Yep. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, I think we're running a little low on time. Is there anything else you want to tell our listeners about before we let you go? And is Exxon like looking to hire more C++ developers? Uh, yeah. So, so I, I mentioned that we've we've grown a lot. We're uh, we're still growing. We're uh, we're expecting again to kind of double in size over the next year. Wow. Uh, we hope for a lot of those. Uh, Billy and I definitely are hoping for a lot of those hires to be in the uh, the software engineering uh, space. And actually, uh, so right now we're specifically looking for uh, more software software engineering focused uh, C plus. So uh, one of the questions actually that we had discussed is on our robot. Every everything running on the robot is C plus plus. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a we did recently introduce a. Uh, a web UI front end just to start and stop the captures for that mapping only system that I that I looked at. But other than that, everything running directly on the robot is C plus plus. So um, going back to what I was saying, we're we're specifically right now hire, trying to hire a, a software engineer to to uh, to introduce a little bit more of a good good software engineering focus into some of the the robotics development that we're doing. I would like to pluralize your statement, Brandon. We're looking <laughs> to hire software engineers. <laughs> so maybe I, we can, can provide find, a link. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll provide that in the show notes. OK. But it, there's, I think it's pretty easy to get to just from exon.com. Join us. And, and is the company, where is the company located? And are you interested in hiring remote developers as well? So we're, we're located in Philly. Uh, we do have some remote developers in Philadelphia. We, we do have some remote developers already. It, it depends a little bit on the role that you can imagine. Um, so one of the cool things about our job actually is we have a flight space right right in our office. So we have developers working in some areas, some developers like working right on the side of that flight space. So you'll have drones zipping back and forth in the flight, protected by nets, nice. but drones <laughs> zipping back and forth in the, in the flight space. Uh, so depending on kind of how hands-on the particular role might be, then it, there might be a preference for being on site, but there are definitely lots of roles where uh, remote is also uh, possible. Now, do either one of you have one of these drones and, and arms reach so that you could just, for the viewers who watch this later, be enticed to come play with your toys? Uh, sadly, we are both working from home right now. Um, okay. Do not have one at home, but uh, we can make sure to, to get something in the, in the show notes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Brian and Billy, it was great talking to you both today. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, guys. It was great to meet that you. That was fun. Thanks.